And the curveballs keep coming, folks. So it looks like my audio device decided to give out at the last possible moment as well. So I switched over to an alternate one. Uh, welcome to the show. Let me know if that works better. It looks like uh, <laughs> it looks like um, our alternate is uh, finally working. Uh, alternate uh, streaming channel, alt alternate voice uh, setup, but uh, it's working. So that's the important part. Uh, welcome to Blazing into Summer with Telerik. We have a week long event lined up for you. This is day two. Uh, it was supposed to be a webinar. We jumped over to Twitch when uh, our other platform went down. So thanks for moving and joining us here. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, we have a, um, a detailed webinar today uh, to talk about full stack C Sharp apps with Telerik UI for Blazor and Entity Framework. Uh, the agenda today is to show you what a full stack Blazor application looks like. Um, I have a demo that I've been working on for you all, and it includes uh, lots of really cool things that you can do with Blazor. Uh, it, it has a lot of uh, Telerik UI for Blazor baked in, so you're gonna see Entity Framework and Web API, uh, working with Create, Read, and Update, and Delete. Um, and then we have some advanced read operations with the uh, data source request. So we're going to go over all these things. Uh, we have about an hour, and uh, there's quite a lot of information to share. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, we're going to be looking at a full stack Blazor application. So I'm running WebAssembly client side Blazor um, on the front end of the application. And then I have a server that is running ASP.NET Core and using Web API. So the server uses Web API to produce a JSON uh, response and send that down to our client. And we use HTTP client on the Blazor WebAssembly application to talk to that Web API endpoint and receive the JSON information. Um, and you'll see when we're doing this that we actually don't need to worry too much about the JSON. All of that is abstracted away by these two frameworks for us. So everything is nice and clean. And we've got C Sharp running on both the client and server side of the application. Uh, you'll also see a lot of use of the Telerik UI for Blazor in this demo application, uh, mainly the Telerik data grid. But we have 40 plus native Blazor components in our suite of tools. Uh, you'll see a few of them uh, mixed throughout the application that I have, but we're gonna focus mainly on CRUD operations today, the data grids, server-side sorting, grouping, and filtering, and paging abilities, which is quite amazing stuff. Uh, we have virtualization in that grid, charts, schedulers. Uh, we have office document processing. So if you have PDF files or office docs like DOCX, uh, Word documents, spreadsheets, all of those things, we can actually process those on the client in WebAssembly or on the server in ASP.NET. Uh, we have themes for this or for all of our components as well, and you'll see those uh, themes being heavily leveraged in the application as well. Uh, globalization and localization are supported, and of course, accessibility comes right out of the box. Uh, throughout the demos, you will see me use Telerik Fiddler as well. So Fiddler is a free tool by Telerik Progress, and it allows you to inspect HTTP calls between uh, you and the application. Uh, so we'll use this to test endpoints, troubleshoot uh, any problems that we face in our web API projects. And of course, this tool is free. So go grab that today. On the back end of the application, you're going to see me use ASP.NET Core. And we use ASP.NET Core for RESTful services. So we're going to have ASP.NET Core interacting with our data persistence layer and sending HTTP responses uh, over the wire. And to do that, we'll use the action result of T, which produces the result response uh, that we'll be sending down to the client. You'll also see me use the HTTP verb uh, attribute quite a bit. 
And this lets us identify our HTTP endpoints on the server side, and that uh, gives us our get, put, post, and delete verbs. So when we're doing CRUD operations, uh, we can send information up to the server, and the server knows how to handle those things based on the verbs it receives. You also see me use uh, the from body attribute on the server, and this allows us to target where we want our information to come from our post when we send information up to the server so we can get information from the body of that post and use that um, filter to bind data uh, in our endpoint. And of course, we'll be working with status codes because we're working with H uh, HTTP requests. Um, and it's, this is a RESTful service. So we're going to be sending back things like 200 codes and whatnot. So you may see those terminologies come up uh, during this as well. Now, I'm also going to show a little bit of swagger. It seems to be something that people really enjoy when they're working with ASP.NET Core on the server. Uh, this is a plugin that allows us to inspect our endpoints and share data and metadata about our endpoints. Uh, so you'll see that being used, um, especially the swashbuckle uh, NuGet package has already been installed in this application. We'll take a look at that as well. For data persistence, I'm using Entity Framework Core. So some of the things that will be uh, familiar here are the DB context or our context of our database. Uh, we have several DB sets to work with. Uh, we'll show off some uh, scaffolding that we can use uh, to help move along our uh, creation of controllers. Uh, we'll focus on iQueryable a little bit. And especially when we use the Telerik data source request object, uh, this is going to help us uh, formulate those iQueryable um, interfaces uh, without pretty much any code at all. So that's going to be an interesting demo to show. And of course, we'll take a look at some of the queries this produces as well. Uh, I have everything already set up to display the queries that Entity Framework generates. So we can take a look and see what kind of SQL queries these things actually produce. And then on the front end of the application, we're using Blazor WebAssembly. So some of the things we'll get familiar with today are HTTP client. We're going to use get from JSON async and post as JSON async to connect to that backend uh, web API. And uh, these are things that we can use to do those CRUD operations from the client side and push the information up to the server and let it process that data. And uh, when we get a response back from the server, again, we'll use those status codes. So you'll see me use uh, the is success status code and things like that. Um, we'll take a quick look at Navigation Manager and how to access our authorized tokens as well. Uh, that actually comes in pretty handy when you need to do some really custom things and authorization is enabled. And we have a full session on uh, authorization on Thursday as well, if that type of stuff is interesting to you. So let's jump into our first set of demos. Um, I have some uh, I have some code that I've been working on. This project is up on our GitHub. We'll share the link to that uh, in chat. And at the end of the show, we'll share the link as well. Let's give the application a quick run so we can get a look at what exactly we're working with today. And when the application is running here, we'll, we'll also take a look at uh, what it is that's powering all of this application. So you can see we have a tray, or um, uh, we have our Telerik um, drawer component that we can use to navigate our application. And we can look at a sales dashboard and whatnot. But it, notice when I click on the link, I'm uh, pushed off to an authentication page. So we'll go ahead and click login, make sure logged in for our demos. Uh, so that just shows that uh, Blazor uh, client and server can work together for authentication. And we'll dive a little bit more into that on Thursday. But it's important just to note that we're, we're authenticating not only the front end, but the back end for this entire application. We're going to work a little bit on this page today where we dig into our uh, sales report. And we also have an employees page that shows off a data grid with some customization. 
And I also have a page here that I've left blank called products. We're gonna work on the products page first. Before we get too far into this, let's take a look at our solution explorer and see what the application looks like as a full stack Blazor application. So the first thing to note is that we are using the um, hosted Blazor application template to get started. And it's been heavily modified. I've done a lot of development here. And I've got the setup of a client, which is our Blazor WebAssembly application, the server, which has our web API and database uh, DB context information. And then I have a shared folder that has all of my data modeling. So I can share my data model from the client and server application and have it in a common place. And this is something that's nice and unique to Blazor is that I can reuse my client or my um, model code on both the client and server. I don't have to have a separate JavaScript model on the client side to match my C sharp model on the server. I actually have one common place to find um, all of my models. So let's take a look at what we're working with now. We're going to add a product page. So I have a shared model that has uh, a group, a product SKU, cost, and a nutrition file name. So we can upload files and attach it to that record. So that's the product object that we'll be working with. And that's in a shared location. I also have my client side of the application and under pages, I have a manage products view. And right now this view is blank. That's the one that we're looking at here. Notice there's nothing on this page. Uh, I've got a little bit of um, stuff set up in the header of the document. So I have a page route so I can navigate to the component that shows um, that shows the product page. Uh, I have an inject directive that's going to inject my HTTP client. So at inject is going to resolve the HTTP client instance and bring it into this component for me. And then finally, I have an authorize attribute because I have uh, identity and authorization enabled across the entire application on the front and back end. And I want to check, make sure the user is authorized to see this view. Other than that, I have nothing here. So I need to create a, um, a view for the user. So let's take a look at the back end because we're going to need to get some data from the back end so we can display it in this view. And right now I have some controllers set up, but I need to create a brand new products controller because I don't have a products controller yet. You see under controllers, I have sales and teams and countries, employees, but I don't have products. I do have a database context for, um, for these objects and I have a sales or sorry, I have a products DB set. So my entity framework instance is set up here with my DB set of product. What I need to do is I need to get a controller set up so I can uh, interact with that uh, set of data. So I'm going to right click on controllers and hit add new controller. And this is a feature that is built into Visual Studio and is part of Entity Framework Core. And I'm going to use the scaffolding tools here to look at my DB context and produce a web API controller for me. So I'm going to click on API controller with actions using Entity Framework and hit add. And I'm going to select my product type from uh, from my model, my model uh, namespace in my shared um, shared project, and I'm going to point at my DB context for the coffee context. Uh, it's called coffee context because the application is the Blazor Coffee Roasters application, and the controller is going to be named Products Controller, and I'm going to hit Add. So let's take a look and see what we get from the generated code. And the scaffolding tool has actually built all of the app or all of the API code for me. And out of the box, it gives me a route of API slash controller, which identifies the controller name of products. So now I have API slash controller 
or sorry, API slash products that I can hit. And if I do a get, I get all of the products from my database. You can see I have DB context dot products to list async. This is going to return an action result of I enumerable of product. And that is a collection of products that I can then display in my application. So I also have the ability to uh, read individual records, uh, post an update to a product, uh, add a brand new product, or delete a product. So the CRUD operations are all built into the controller scaffolding already. And I should be able to use this now to build my UI layer. Before we dive into the UI, let's take a quick look at our application's um, web API endpoint that we just created. I want to show some of the deep integrations that are available here. So I've enabled something called Swagger on my application. So if I go to my application slash Swagger, I'll get a list of all of the APIs available in my web API project. And if you look, this is the newly scaffolded products uh, API that I created. And if I look under products, it tells me what kind of response that I'm going to get back from my products, um, my products controller, if I call API slash product. That's the singular product. If I look at the plural version, I get a list of uh, these products back. And I can even test these if I click try it out. But first, I need to log in. So I'm going to get uh, a login token and use it on the application here. So to get that login token, uh, you'll notice if I click authorize, it's asking for a bearer token. And this comes from my web API or my um, authentication that's been set up on my, my project. So I'm going to navigate for a second. Uh, back over to my project. And I'm going to hit one of these pages with Telerik Fiddler enabled. So Fiddler, again, is uh, an application I can use. It's a Telerik product. It's free. And I can use that to sniff API traffic. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to one of my authenticated views here. And inside of this view, I've hit a sales request. I'm going to double click on this. And inside of the sales request, I can look at my header and I can actually get uh, my authentication header, my bearer token from uh, the application, um, or sorry, the, the request header information under security. So I'm going to go ahead and copy the header from this. And I'm going to go back over to Swagger now that I've borrowed my authentication token. And once I'm back in Swagger, I can click Authorize again. I'm going to paste in this token. I'm going to remove this authorization um, uh, field here and just leave bearer and then the token information and click Authorize. So now I'm logged into the Swagger uh, API here, and I can now try out the different API endpoints through Swagger. So people really like Swagger. You can do these things um, also in Fiddler. And Fiddler makes a nice companion to this as well, so I can get my API token out and use it here. Um, you'll notice that I, all these locks are now enabled, so I can simply uh, try these endpoints out and see how they work. So if I click Try Out and then Execute, um, you can see the responses that I get back from the server. So the response body is JSON. And uh, these JSON types are actually going to be serialized and deserialized by the .NET framework on both ends. So I don't really need to worry too much about the information that's coming across, but it's good to see that my API is working and I'm able to query the database and get information uh, out of my, um, my endpoint. So I can try any of these web API endpoints. And again, these are coming from ASP.NET web API that's hosting my Blazor application. So let's go ahead and work on some UI for this.
uh, we can see that our web API works. We've logged in with Swagger. Uh, we've hit one of our endpoints. We see that data is coming back. Um, we saw that authorization is working. Uh, the next thing we need to do is start building a screen so we can manage our products. So the first thing I'm going to do is put a Telerik grid on the page. And I've got some code snippets that I've predefined, uh, so you guys don't have to watch me type. I know that can get a little cumbersome when you're watching um, online. Um, so I've added a Telerik grid component to the page, and I'm telling it I want to get data uh, from a products field. And I'm going to auto-generate the columns in the data grid. Now, in my code block, I have an I enumerable of product, and the property is called products. I'm going to tap into a lifecycle method in Blazor called onInitializedAsync. This lifecycle method runs every time the component is uh, rendered for the first time. And when this component renders, I'm going to call an HTTP request. So I'll call HTTP.get from JSON async, and I'm going to expect back an array of product. Now remember, I showed you that JSON is being sent across the wire on both from both the endpoint and received on Blazor, but on both my API controller and on the receiving end in the WebAssembly project, I'm using .NET types. So I have an array of product. I don't have to do any serialization myself. The framework actually serializes it into JSON from the HTTP, HTTP response. And then when I get it on the receiving end in Blazor, it's going to uh, turn that back into uh, an array of products automatically. Now, when I bind this data, the Telerik grid is going to bind that list of products. and uh, auto-generate all of the columns that correspond uh, to that list. So I'm going to hit Control F5 here to reload my screen. And we'll navigate back to the products page. And now you can see I have a full dump of that uh, data table on my page. So I have my ID, the group of the product, the SKU, the cost. And these are automatically generated from the component. So I didn't have to write the individual column information. So just a few lines of code here, and I've already got a data table uh, that is pulling data out of my database and displaying it on the screen for users. That's pretty handy stuff, but I want to add some more detail here. So I'm going to update the grid a little bit with a little more information. I'm going to turn this auto-generated columns off and then I'm going to add some specific column information to the data grid. So I'm still pulling from the same data using the HTTP request to define. I've turned groupable on, sortable to true, pageable to true, and gave it a page size. So this will make the UI experience a little bit better because I'll be able to group and sort and filter things. Um, I've also got a template in place to format the cost of the products that are in the database. Um, and we could use localization here. I don't have it prepared for this demo, but we could also localize the currency if we would like to. So we're going to template the cost to make sure it at least has the dollar sign on there. Um, and then I've got some other stuff that we'll add here in just a moment. And it looks like we need some, um, we need to up the font size just a little bit. Some folks are having a hard time seeing. So we'll bump up the font. Uh, let's go for 16 here. That should be plenty for everyone to see well. Uh, so we've, we've got some new features enabled. Uh, we haven't changed anything about our data yet. We'll go ahead and refresh this page again, and we'll see what these new features look like. I'm going to go ahead and close out any of these lingering tabs while we do this. And you can see I have about the same display here now, but I have some paging enabled. And notice that all of the products belong to different groups. 
I can actually take this group, drag it, and drop it into the header. And I get a nice grouped view here if I want to see what products uh, belong to what groups. So that's nice to have. And that's all done by, just by simply turning on some features uh, in the data grid component. So the next thing I want to do is add some functionality to do some CRUD operations here. So in the data grid, I have built in a grid toolbar. And I'm going to enable the add ability here. So I have an add command. And it's going to add a button with an icon so I can add products to uh, my product table. And then I'm also going to go and enable a column that's called a command column. The command column has command buttons in it. So I can do things like edit, save, delete, and so on. So these are all my CRUD operations. And there's a nice little flag that I can set in here as well. So I can toggle when those buttons show. Uh, do they show during edit mode? Um, or do they just show uh, in the main column when I'm not in edit mode? So I have the full control to show and hide these as I need to. So I'll go ahead and save those. We'll come back into the application and take a look again. And now we have our edit and add product buttons. So I'll click add product and you see I've got an inline um, editor that shows up so I can uh, walk through the information here and update uh, the information. However, these buttons aren't tied to anything yet. So you'll notice that if I hit delete, uh, there's nothing happening here in the UI. I haven't wired these up to anything. I've only created the buttons. So we're gonna need to add some functionality uh, to our application to make those buttons actually do something. So another thing that I want to do, I'm dropping some code in here so I can enable some more features on my grid. So I want to be able to customize the editor for the dropdown. So you saw that I have uh, or for the groups. So you saw that I have groups in my view here. And when I click add or edit a product, I get a static text box. Well, I want to show that we can customize uh, these fields in our editor. And in order to do that, I need to first go back to the database and query for all of the groups that are available on that table. So let's go ahead over to the controller and let's add a new HTTP endpoint on our products controller. So I want to get just the groups, the unique items, um, and display those. So I'm going to create a new endpoint here. I'm going to say HTTP get, and I'm going to give it a route of groups. So it will be uh, API slash products slash groups, and I'll get all of the product groups back. We'll do that by taking the products table and running a select on it, and grabbing the distinct values from the group column on the table. And those will just come back as an I enumerable of string. So we'll save that change. And then back in our front end, we're going to do the same thing we did to populate the grid. We're, we'll create an I enumerable of groups or of string, call it groups. And then we'll make an HTTP call out to our endpoint and populate uh, that list. So the next thing I need to do is add a group template. So all of the data columns in our uh, Telerik UI for Blazor data grid are fully templatable. So I'm going to go into my group column, and I'm going to open this tag up, and I'm going to insert some code here. So in my group column, I now have two template regions. I have a regular template for when I'm displaying data, and then I have an editor template that's going to display when the grid is in edit mode. And it doesn't matter which edit mode I'm in, this template will override the editor uh, that is currently being used for that data point. So in my regular template, I'm going to look at the row and see what the value is of the data being bound to that row. So I have a product that I'm getting from that column or that row of data. The next thing I'm going to do is create a piece of HTML 
that has an image and the group name in a span. So I'm going to give this an image and I'm going to get that image information from the name of the group and concatenate that to uh, the extension for an image file. So I'm putting that in an image path and I'll get a nice image uh, displayed next to my group name and I get the same th uh, the group name here and display that um, alongside the image as well. In the editor template, I have another component inside the template. So this is what's nice about templates in Blazor. So we can have regular HTML, we can have razor markup, we can have components, we can have a combination of all three. Inside the editor template, I have a Telerik drop-down list that also has its own template. So I have templates within templates and our controls can completely handle this no problem. So I have an editor template with my drop-down list and now I'm gonna get a nice drop-down list of all the groups available and I can even put that same image path in here and get an image inside of my drop-down list. So let's do a control F5 here, run the application again. We'll drop some of these other tabs away. And notice I've got my group column here that's displaying an image now uh, that pertains to the, the type of group that we're in. Is it a drink? Is it consumer food? Uh, those are the type of groups that I have. Now if I hit add product, you'll notice I have a drop down list with the same imagery in it. So I can select those items and uh, have a, a controlled way to select the groups instead of just a freeform text box. So now I can, I've shown that I have full control over the type of uh, form elements that come up. We'll do a little bit more with this in a bit. So I still haven't ed, uh, added editing capabilities to it. We have the command buttons, uh, but they're not wired up to anything. So what I need to do next is I need to add some more functionality to my grid. I'm going to enable some more properties here and I'm going to add a couple of events. So I want to handle some events for uh, for my data grid. So I've got an on update, on delete, and an on create event that I want to handle. So I haven't defined the event handlers for these yet but the buttons that I added on the command bar will in, uh, invoke the on update, on delete, and on create methods. Now it's up to me to handle how I want those um, commands to be um, handled by my application. How do I want to create those elements? Do I take the data out of the form? Do I have to manipulate any of that data before I push it off uh, to the endpoint and let it work in Entity Framework? Well. I have full control over all that because uh, the grid lets me handle the events instead of doing it internally. So we're not working with a black box scenario here. We have full control over all these things. So I'm going to um, change up some of my code here just a little bit and I'll explain what these new things are that I added because I added quite a bit of new stuff here. First of all, I changed over from an IEnumerable of products to an observable collection of products. Now the reason I did that is I don't want to have to write custom code to go back and maybe refetch data to display it in the grid. Um, I want the data grid to automatically just update the rows that we changed and we can do that by assigning the data to an observable collection instead of an enumerable. So the observable collection has a little bit uh, more intelligence to it and the data grid can use that to inform itself when an element has been updated, added, deleted, and change the UI automatically for us. So that's the first change. We're using uh, observable collection of product. Um, we're going to pull the data in using the same API and we're going to assign that uh, to an observable, co observable collection here instead of an enumerable. And now I have some methods that I've added, a create item, delete item, and update item. These are all almost identical. So it's really easy stuff. It's just a few lines of code here to make uh, an HTTP call and pass some information to the server. 
So let's take a look at create item first. So the data grid gives me a command uh, argument and it gives me the item that the command argument was invoked for. So in this case, I'm getting a product back from the grid and this is going to be the product that's correspond to uh, the item that was entered when I clicked to the create button. So when I click create on the user interface right here, add product, and I fill this information in and hit update, I'm going to invoke the create item method and I'm going to get the item that the user entered in. The next thing we do is take that item and post it to the server using post as JSON async. Blazor is going to serialize that into JSON and send it up to our endpoint um, in the body of the request. So it's going to go up to the API slash products and it's going to go to the post uh, method. So the post verb on the HTTP uh, response or HTTP endpoint. Um, I'm going to look and see if that message was successful. So if I have a successful post to the server, I should get back a 200 code or an is success status code. If I get back success, I know that I can read that product back out of the response because the endpoint is going to give me back the ID, which is valuable to me on the front end, uh, to know that I've successfully inserted a new record in the database. And then I can take the products um, observable collection, call insert, and push that new item back in to the um, the data, that insert will then invoke an update on that record of data, making the data grid uh, show the new record. And it's pretty much the same type of thing for each one of these create, update, and delete statements. So if I hit delete, I get the item, I call a request, I get a success code, I remove the item from the collection, the grid automatically sees that and updates it. With update, we can do the same thing. When I hit update, I get the item, I post it to the server. This time I'm going to use a combination of the ID and the element just to make sure that this is a valid update and it's not some type of um, hijacking or something like that. It's a little tiny bit of security in there. And then I'm going to check again to make sure I have a successful status code. And when I do, I'm going to go through each property and update the properties for that object. Now there's a little bit of an important note here because if I were to replace the entire object, um, the observable collection doesn't see that as an update. So it will not trigger an update event. So if I update each of these individually, I will get that uh, grid to update. So now I can rerun my data grid. We'll go back and just by adding those three methods and handling those events, uh, we have full edit capabilities in here. So I can come up to my first item and increase the cost here and click update. Notice my cost is now $7. I can come in and add a new product. I can select, uh, let's say, a consumer drink. And uh, personally, I like a good Cortado. I spell it right. Um, we'll give that a price and we'll hit update here as well. And we've just entered a new inf um, a new line item into our products. And notice I get the ID back. So it's a brand new ID of 22. So that shows that we're making round trip. We sent data to the server, processed it in the database and got back a response with a new ID in it. If I refresh the page, just for a quick sanity check, we'll give this a sort. Notice I've inserted that item into uh, my database. So now let's take a look at one more step in this. And I have a, uh, let's see here. I need to use a little magic of Git because we're going to reset some of our demos. So give me a second while I clear out any of the changes that we just made. And I'm going to move to the next demo. And there we go. Our code is back. 
We'll give this a quick compile. We'll go visit that page again uh, as it looks with, when it is fully completed. So this looks about the same here, except I've also enabled a pop-up editor, which is a nice UX. Uh, this is done just by toggling a quick property on our data grid. So I've set the edit mode to pop up here, and that automatically enables a pop-up um, on my UI. And notice my template still works here. I didn't have to make any changes uh, to make that template update. And I also get uh, validation in here as well. So if I haven't selected a group, notice the group field is required. So I automatically get validation in this view as well. So I can select an item, add a new product, and update it. And then I also have this nutrition information. It says save and then edit to add nutrition info. It's because I have a record that I haven't created yet, so I can't attach a file to something that doesn't exist. I don't have an ID, nothing to attach that file information to. So I'm going to go ahead and add a record. And notice all of these nutrition info boxes say not available. This is our templates at work. There's no data here. So it's showing a default state of not available. If I click edit, now I have an, a, an editor here that has a select files dialog. So in this uh, template, I've added an editor template that has a Telerik file upload component. And this has some methods to send some information up to the server. And it has a save URL, and it has an on upload method. It also has an on success method. So if we look down in our code again, we're going to handle the on upload and on success, just like we did with the grids methods. The upload uh, component has similar methods that we can inspect and uh, do some work with. So when we're uploading a file, one of the things that is really important is to make sure that we're still authorizing that user. So the endpoint requires us to use that same bearer token that I used for the Swagger demo earlier. We can get that with Blazor using the navigation manager and the I, um, the I access token provider. So I'm going to call on I access token provider, request the user's token, and then add that to my authorization header for my file upload. The next thing is the six or the um, uh, the the component handles the save URL and it attaches the uh, product information and the authorization header and sends the file to the server. And on the products controller, we're just using the built-in I file um, I form file interface to get the file from the Telerik upload component uh, that was sent to this endpoint. And then we can add that to our database. Uh, we can save that file to disk and create a reference for it in the record. What's really cool about this example and a little bit of the reason why I fast forward is a lot of uh, typing uh, to implement um, the file save mechanics here because I'm actually tapping into an API in the Telerik UI libraries to do some file conversions. So this is um, some really helpful stuff because I can go into my data grid and when I select files, I'm going to select a nutrition information DOCX file and <laughs> The demo, the demo gods are not happy today, so that's going to fail. Uh, but that um, that piece of code will actually convert using the Telerik data processing library the DOCX file into a PDF. Now, I may need to recompile the application for that demo to work, or there may be um, a missing authentication token because of the branching that I just did. Uh, so we can revisit that later. For the meantime, we're going to move on to the next demo. So when I switched branches, uh, let's see, let's try to recompile and reload the application just to make sure 
that we're in a good state here. Everything succeeded. Um, when I recompiled the application and changed branches, I moved over to a branch that is missing the sales logic. And it's currently pulling um, the same uh, type of data uh, methods that our, um, our product managed product screen uses. But managed products only has 24 items in it. And this table has 20,000 items in it. So you'll notice a considerable lag here when we're loading our uh, sales information into the data grid. It's going out to the database. It's fetching 20,000 records, pulling all of that data back. And then we end up only showing 10 of those records on the page. So this is not a good way to do performance. And there are some built-in functionalities that we can use with the Telerik UI for Blazor data grid to tell the server to only request the data that we need to display this data grid. So what I'm going to do next is instead of having our database pull all 20,000 records to display only 10, we're going to go into that sales view and make some updates. So I'm going to go over to sales.razor. And here's my Telerik grid. Um, it's using a simple I enumerable here. And it's just pulling the data with the oninitialized async method, similar to how we started with the products uh, page that we just worked on. So the first thing I want to do is go back to my controller, and I'm going to add um, a new method to allow me to ask the server for only the data I need. So instead of calling API sales and tapping the entire database, uh, let's go back and make a change here. So on my sales controller, currently it says uh, context.sales to list async. That pulls every record, all 20,000 uh, or more that may be in there. So that's not very efficient. I'm going to go ahead and add a new method here. We'll take and do a quick comparison. So I'm going to change this from a get to a post because I'm going to share a bunch of data with the web API endpoint um, that I'm going to want to put in, a, in an HTTP post. So I've got a lot of form-like data. I've got to have sorting, filtering, grouping, paging, all of those things. And I can package those up nice and neat um, in a post. And I can put that in the body of the request. So I'm going to say, from body, give me the data source request object. This is something my data grid can generate. And the data source request object has my sorting information, any filters I've applied to the data grid, the paging information and all of that. And it's going to put uh, it's going to put that in the request and send it to the server. Here's the the wonderful part is on my server. I'm going to take that data source request. I'm going to turn it into something called a data source result. So I'm going to take DB context. I'm going to say give me all the or give me the sales table and do a two data source uh, two two data source result async, and I'm going to pass in the request. This little snippet of code here, this is actually an extension method from the Telerik UI library. So this is an extension on the iQueryable interface. This little piece of extension method is magic. This tells my um, entity framework to create the SQL queries that are needed to only get the data for my data grid that applies to those filters, the sorting information and the paging information. That's all done in one extension method. So we're going to apply all of that information to the sales table and only get back the result. The next thing we're going to do is put it in a simple abstraction. It's called data envelope. This is something uh, that you can write very quick and easy to encapsulate the data that's coming back. It's just going to take a list, a generic list, and that's going to be our current page data. And then we also want the total item count, because we're going to display that in the data grid. 
So we can get this from our data source result. That's what we're going to do next. We're going to take the data source result and just map it to the current page data and the total items. So this is the data source result is a very generic object that we create for you because you may be able to use or you can use this um, with other Telerik libraries like the Kendo UI grid, for example, that is platform ag agnostic. Uh, so we're taking the data source request or result that's platform agnostic. It could be used with any JavaScript library and just wrapping a simple type around it. So Blazor can understand uh, that we're going to deserialize this into a sale. And this will also light up our Swagger API to let it know that we're returning sales back. We'll return that data. And now we have to manipulate that on the client. So I'm going to go back over to the sales portion here. And I'm going to add a new method here. So instead of getting back an I enumer I enumerable of data, I'm going to request a data envelope. And again, remember, I can share on the client and server the same data type. So this is a shared data type that I have in my shared library. So you can see data envelope down here. It's actually maybe blocked by my, yes, it is. My, my um, avatar is blocking that. I'll move this out uh, too far out. If I scroll down in my project, and then I can zoom in. You can see my data envelope is in my shared namespace here. So I can share it across my client and server. So my client side WebAssembly project and my Web API project both know what to, uh, know, both know about this type and have access to it. So I can use that on my client side. So instead of calling an IEnumerable, I'm going to say give me a data envelope back that has my page of data and the total for the amount of records that belong to that data, uh, that query. And then I'm going to post as JSON async the argument.request. So this is coming from, uh, instead of doing the uninitialize async, I'm letting the, data's, uh, the data grid request the data through its own method called read items. So this is an initialization method from the data grid itself. And it's going to give me um, the arguments that belong to the data grids sorting, paging, and filtering uh, settings. And when I make a change or the data grid needs new data, this read items uh, method will be called. And it's going to post as JSON async all of that information. And again, any framework to do it will do all the filtering and we'll get a response code of 200 back. And we can reapply the data that was received from that data envelope. So now I need to go back up here and make a quick change. I'm not binding just to data anymore. I'm binding to my data model, which is the envelope dot current page data and model dot total item count. And then I've got my read method that I've bound to the read items event handler. So now I can reload this page. And remember, it took a long time to load that page at the beginning. Now when I click on sales, and it loads immediately, because I'm only fetching 10 records from my database instead of 20,000. And as I page through, you can see the paging is quick and responsive. And this handles all of my filtering as well. So I can come in and I can search for hot tea and filter just those items. And notice my skew is filtered. And I'm getting back 10 of uh, 1,026 records. If I go over to my project and I look at my web server, I've actually enabled on my web server um, some verbose logging. And I did this on purpose because I want to see what it is the data source request object is actually doing. So if I look in here, I can see a couple queries being executed. 
And this is what Entity Framework got from that data source request um, method that we called to data source result async. When I call that, Entity Framework actually transforms that code into a SQL query. And this is getting the total records for the query. So it's going to say select count star where hot t equals. And uh, it, tra it even does uh, lowercase on this to make sure that we're getting everything uh, that applies to that filter. The second command is the actual query taking place. So the first is just for the count. Um, and then the second is for the query. And this is the proper SQL query, actually, that you would need to write to make this happen. The other thing you'll notice in the second query is it's only getting the page. So we've got the count. So we can actually annotate this a little bit. So that query is going to get the count. The second query is going to get the data. And it's also going to get the page and the offset. And you can see the paging information coming in right here. This limit and offset is actually the query getting the information about paging. So I can offset, I can skip and take just the page that I need. And it's doing all that automatically with that simple call. If we look back at the controller again, it's doing that all with this one extension method. And it's producing the right Entity Framework information for Entity Framework to turn into a proper SQL query uh, so we don't have to be SQL experts. And we don't have to write a bunch of uh, logic in here to examine the properties from the grid ourselves and say, if it has a filter, then add this iQueryable.where uh, statement. It's all encapsulated in the two data source result async. It's very powerful stuff. It's very quick and easy to add your project. Um, it's a feature that I've been using with our other Telerik products for years. So we'll take one last uh, jump over to our master. And we'll take a last look at the completed project that you can find on GitHub. I think my branch switching broke something again. Ah, there's still a checkout in progress. So let's look at, um, let's see if we have any questions uh, that our team would like to highlight that I may have missed while I was trying to do the presentation. Or if anybody has questions now, be happy to take questions while uh, the project, actually, let me close the solution and I'll open a less, um, a more stable version of it. How do you handle client side selection with this? Uh, so the client side selection on the data grid can be handled um, by some data binding. So if we go to docs, or sorry, demos.telerik.com, there's actually some excellent demos up here of all the grids functionality. Uh, and in the data grid, uh, you will see a selection. Uh, let's see here. I know I'm probably glancing over it. Selection. If we check selection here um, in view source, this is actually some very simple data binding. So we say at bind selected items. And the data grid will give us back an enumerable or list of selected items, depending on what item type they are. So if I scroll down, yeah, I get an enumerable of selected items here. So you can see public, enumerable of customer. Um, yes, you can use a custom editor in the pop-up grid. Uh, the one that I showed actually had some custom features to it. Uh, so it had a custom drop down box that was added for the group capability there. Um, you can use either, there's three edit modes. There's some questions around editing. Uh, there is inline editing, 
like this, where we produce um, an editor in line. There is also a pop-up and then an in-cell editor as well. So uh, there's multiple edit functionalities here, uh, and they're very simple to change through toggling a, a setting. Uh, requests are done by an await. Can you also have a callback or a TypeScript like subscribe to handle the data? Um, I'm not sure exactly how that would work in Blazor. I haven't experienced that myself. Um, so I don't know yes or no on that one. Um, the video should be up on our YouTube channel uh, after this is done. Uh, so there, um, there's some questions about state management. Uh, there are some open source projects. Um, I think Fluxor may have actually gone away. We're going to cover some of these on Friday. But uh, as far as state management, Blazor State is one that you can use to manage state. And I believe that one is being kept current. You can see the uh, last update was three days ago. This is a state management or a, a flux react uh, a redux type of uh, implementation. Um, let's see here. Can you achieve what you've presented by calling stored procedures and not use Entity Framework? You can completely use stored procedures. However, uh, when you call the convenience method that is in here for um, the products, um, or the, sorry, the sales information, where we call to data source request async, uh, that would not that would be something you'd have to then write yourself. So if you're taking control of the queries yourself, uh, you can't have the magically generated queries <laughs> that come from any framework. Um, you can, of course, mix and match certain scenarios if you need to. Um, if you want to have all of the sorting, filtering, and all of that done through any framework and you're comfortable with letting the two data source result handle that, you can do that and then use hard-coded uh, stored procedures for all of your other things. Um, let's see. Uh, I think I managed uh, our answered client side state management. A lot of people like their stored procedures, which is fine. This is all compatible with stored procedures. You're just responsible for writing those stored procedures. Uh, which I think is the point that you all are getting at. So I think we're all on the same page here. Um, how responsive is the Teller grid when used with Bootstrap? Um, so there are no real built-in responsive functionalities quite yet. They are on the roadmap. Um, those things uh, are coming, and they they are not easy things to tackle. But uh, they are on, definitely on the roadmap. So there are some responsive behaviors you can add yourself. Um, I actually have a package out there called Blazor Size that will help with that. Um, so we'll, again, on Friday, we're going to go over some of these things in detail. But uh, in Blazor Size, you could actually decide which columns you want to display and what screen sizes and whatnot. But eventually, this will be baked. This um, functionality will be baked in uh, to the product. Uh, again, local storage, we're going to cover that one on Friday as well. Um, so on uh, there's a package called Blazard Local Storage. 
And then on, on um, our Friday show, we're going to take a look at some of that as well. So some of the responsive questions, responsive design uh, questions we're getting, uh, some of the uh, UI components are already uh, very responsive. Uh, on the grid front, it's a much more complex component. Um, if you want to see the future of the grid and, and what features um, we plan on adding, you can go to our uh, older product, the Telerik UI for our, sorry, Kendo UI uh, data grid. And we have some quite advanced um, uh, adaptive rendering techniques that we use on the data grid there. Uh, these are not implemented yet. Um, they are some things that we want to have uh, on our grid in the future. Um, you can find those in, oh, let's see, it's gonna be adaptive rendering trying to remember where this example is at, but oh, here we go. At the top of the list, adaptive rendering would be where you would look for the future of uh, what the component can look like. Um, do F12 here, put it in a, let's see, a tablet or phone mode. There we go. What's nice about this approach is, um, oh, it's going to come out quite small here. Let's try refreshing this again. Uh, we do have some nice adaptive behaviors. There we go. Uh, where even the editors and everything adapt, uh, but this would, um, this isn't available yet in the Blazor data grid. But this is something our products are capable of. Um, we just haven't hit feature parity yet with that one. Um, you can use grouping with the two data source requests uh, in result. Um, let's see, I don't know if I had grouping enabled here, but I will quickly see if we do. Um, I didn't have grouping enabled. Let's see. We should be able to test that out very quickly, though. If we go to our sales information, under sales report, uh, let's add sorting, paging, and grouping. We'll add grouping to that. And now we should be able to group by region. If we drag in here, and it looks like grouping may need, we may need to look into that one. Grouping didn't work just out of the box. I'll have to check with our engineering folks and see um, if that is on our list of supported features. But a good question. Um, on Thursday, we're going to look at authorization. Uh, we're not looking specifically at localization. We'll probably have to set up another webinar for that. Looks like there's quite a few people interested in localization. Um, and we do have some demos on the website for localization. If you go to demos.telerik.com, uh, look at the Blazor demos page. Uh, globalization and localization are built into the components. And there should be a demo page here. Uh, let's see. Oh, they're on the individual components, actually. So if I go to the data grid and I look at globalization is the first demo off the list, um, you can see I can select the language and my text changes on the data grid uh, so my create record text and uh, my grouping uh, drag and drop text changed with that. 
So localization is fully supported. Um, we don't have a detailed webinar, unfortunately, scheduled for that one. Will there be an example of using entity associations within context and binding them to the grid? I'm not sure what that means. Um, that might be something that we can ask or we can get into offline maybe on, um, uh, we can maybe follow up on that. Um, do I have any samples apply clean architecture with Blazor, WASM, Blazor, Blazor Server? Uh, so all this stuff is very new and there isn't a whole lot of guidance on best practices yet. Um, however, it is a RESTful application that doesn't um, dif differ too much from how you would handle a JavaScript front end. So the back end's not going to change really at all. You can still use your best practices there, whether you're using AutoMapper, you have a domain-driven experience there. Um, you can use all of that. Uh, the only difference is you can share some of your C-sharp logic with the front end. Uh, so there might be some places where you can split up your domain to handle that a little bit better. Uh, but nobody has put together any guidance from Microsoft on best practices yet. Um, is there any design tool for Visual Studio itself uh, or from Telerik? There's currently no drag and drop type of web forms uh, designer or anything planned um, from Microsoft that we are aware of. Um, it is something that we're interested in hearing more about though. Um, if you have feedback on that, go to feedback.telerik.com and let us know. Is there an advantage of using Entity Framework with the Telerik components over Dapper? Um, the only thing I can point out is that one um, example where you get uh, the, uh, use the two data source requests. Um, I don't know if that is compatible with Dapper. Uh, so that is something that would have to be tested um, to see if it's compatible at all. It should produce a, uh, the two data source request or result should produce a, um, an expression tree that goes up against the iQueryable interface. I don't know what Dapper would do with it though. Um, other than that, there's no differentiator. Uh, it should work the same. Um, let's see here. So many good questions. Uh, any word on connectivity with Cosmos DB? Um, again, the two data source results is going to be the only thing that differs there. Um, other than that, uh, Cosmos DB is totally compatible with the grid um, because on the front end, you're getting back an I enumerable of something or uh, that type of thing. Uh, does Blazor work with a PWA? So that's an excellent question. Um, so we're going to have a full day, or a, not a full day, but a full session dedicated to PWAs tomorrow. And Daniel, Daniel Roth is joining me for that. He's the program manager on the ASP.NET team. Um, let me see if I can get this to cooperate. This is actually a PWA app. Sometimes I'm missing the install button for some reason, though. But I think this will work. May just need to reload the app. There we go. So the question was about PWAs. And again, tomorrow we have um, a PWA uh, session at the same time as this one. But if you notice up here, I have a little plus symbol. 
and it says install PWA files. So this application actually is a PWA. So if I click on this and I hit install, now I have my Blazing Coffee Warehouse app outside of the browser. And if I click on any of my pages here, it'll prompt me to log in. Now that I'm logged in, uh, you can see I've got my taskbar um, information here. I can pin this. I can pin it to my taskbar. I can also pin it to start. Uh, so I get those behaviors. So we, we have the um, ability to make this a PWA. Um, can I share the demo project on GitHub? Sure, let's actually wrap up with some resources. We've hit a lot of questions here. Um, I'm going to swap back over to my presentation here. If you want to learn more about the basics of Blazor and you missed day one, uh, we have a uh, a free ebook that I wrote up on our website. It's at telerik.com slash white papers. So you can grab the ebook there. Uh, so make sure you grab that. Um, the recordings from yesterday's show should be on our YouTube page as well. So you can always watch uh, some of the breakdown of the ebook on yesterday's show on YouTube. Um, it's also worth mentioning that Telerik UI for Blazor has installers for Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and Visual Studio for Mac. So you can have templating features in all of those uh, platforms for Telerik UI and easily start your Telerik UI projects from your favorite editor. And if you want to grab a 30-day free trial, you can get that at Telerik.com slash Blazor UI. Again, there's 40 plus UI components. We saw just a handful of them um, in the demo today, uh, mainly focused on the grid. So um, we could talk about CRUD operations and, uh, and doing uh, some server uh, paging and sorting and things. Um, and then I have a page full of resources here. Uh, we've shared a lot of these links today in the chat, but there is the Telerik UI for Blazor. Um, we have our GitHub page here at uh, github.com. And here I'll paste the GitHub in the chat. So you can find the GitHub there. There are some instructions on getting started with that project. It is intended to run by default with the commercial license. So there's some small modifications that you need to run it um, with a trial license, but it does fully work with a trial license. Uh, you just need to manually update a few things there. Um, Fiddler is free. Make sure you grab that. Um, and then we have some more prizes to give away, Sarah says. Uh, link to the beginner's guide isn't working. So let's see here. Let's double check that while Sarah looks into the prize situation. So it should be telerik.com slash white papers with an S. And then you should see beginner's guide here at the top. And I'll pop this in chat as well. Uh, so Commander Chuck. There's your link. You might you should be able to hit that directly. Can we use just one data grid column for different data types? For example, combo, link, and text. You can fully customize any of the data grid columns or rows with templates and include whatever you would like in there. Um, you can even put charts and grids and or charts and yeah, you can actually embed other grids in uh, rows and columns in the data grid if you'd like. So any of those things should fly. So the templates are very robust. Ah, when you click get it now, nothing happens. Uh, let's see, we should get a pop up here. Uh, looks like, um, Stella, if you're on the call, the download does not seem to be producing anything. Oh, I didn't select there. Oh, there we go. Uh, make sure 
all the validation is working there, Commander Chuck. Uh, that looks like you uh, need to make sure the form is completely filled out. You should be able to get it. Uh, I need to pick a number between 1 and 81. Number between 1 and 81. Um, put me in a tight position here. Let's say 2. The number's 2, Sarah. Oh, so uh, thanks, Commander Chuck. We'll have to look into the browser support. Um, again, Eva, if you're, or um, sorry, not Eva, Stella, if you're on, uh, make sure we, we do a little browser testing on that uh, white paper page. Oh, you need three more? No oh, pick four numbers. Oh, my bad. Uh, pick higher numbers, please. Um, so uh, let's do 12, uh, 160, and uh, 96. How about that? So 2, 12, 160, 96. Was I supposed to put them in order? Uh, lots of folks able to get to um, the ebook, so that is great. Filter by count. Uh, we can. So the filtering on the grid, some questions about filtering. Uh, filtering happens by the column type. Um, so if you even if you use a template, a complex template in there, it's going to filter by the initial type. Um, so if it was an amount or, for example, the, the grouping, I have a photo in here, an image, and it's going to sort by the accessory name, not like the file name, but the actual name that's bound in here because sorting is, is actually sorting on that uh, group. So the template won't override what you're sorting. Um, hoping I get that question correct. Uh, also, some, for some reason, this failed earlier. Let's double check this. I think it was an authentication issue. There we go. That was a something I wanted to show earlier, but um, I was seeing a little little glitch with the repository. Um, so our templating is really awesome because it can do stuff like this, where if I don't have a file, I can just display a line of text. But if I come in and edit this, and I'm going to hit select files here. I'm going to say nutrition information docs. That document gets uploaded to the server. Telerik UI for Blazor's data processing library then converts that document to a PDF. And then when the grid updates, see I have a link to the PDF. So that is our templating in action along with the file upload component um, and also our document processing libraries. So the templates in here are really amazing. Uh, can I show it with an Excel SX? Yes and no. So I could convert that file if I had the logic in place, but check this out. I'm going to hit select files. I have a uh, Excel uh, SX file here. Notice this file type is not allowed. So I've actually told the file upload component to only accept documents or PDF files. So it's going to check for those things and it's going to say you can't upload a uh, um, XLS file. Now I could enable Excel uploads and then I would have to um, just write a simple mapping for converting an Excel document to a PDF, which is totally easy to do with our uh, library. So I won't be able to do it that easily in the um, webinar, but I can show you where that code would exist. And if we go into the application, there's actually an endpoint here in the server component that's the product 
controller has a uh, web API endpoint that accepts an iForm file. And that's the standard practice with uh, .NET is to use the iForm file interface. So our upload component is going to satisfy that. And then it's up to you to do what you want with it. So we could put an Excel file in there. And then we can use our document processing file. If I look, I have a little library here that says uh, file converter, convert Word to PDF. So what I would do is write a convert XLS to PDF method that does the exact same thing. And it would look just like this method here. So I get a rad flow document. That's our Telerik um, uh, class that handles uh, flow document types. So these are like DOCX files. Um, and we get our docs file format provider and we just read the form the file that was uploaded. So we would just read a Excel file instead. Once we have the Excel file in memory, we would call uh, a PDF format provider and use the export method on that format provider. So if you import with format provider A and export with format provider B, you get a file converter. And just in uh, these few lines, this is just one simple method that takes up less than 20 lines of code, uh, we can do a file conversion. And I could easily change this over to an Excel example by just changing out the document format provider. So I would add a Excel doc, uh, an Excel SX format provider here, and I could have that functionality. That's probably the only line actually that we need to change there. Um, local storage we're gonna cover on Friday. Uh, so more questions on local storage. Uh, local storage totally works with our stuff. It's an external package from a NuGet package author uh, who's actually joining me on Thursday. Maybe he can talk a little bit about it on Thursday too. Um, does the PDF format provider have the ability to convert accessible PDFs? That is a great question that one of our engineers would have to take. Um, Yeah, so uh, the best thing to do would be support ticket or um, or reach out to us and uh, we can answer that offline. Uh, let's talk about the shows this um, that are coming up. And then uh, we'll go ahead and say our goodbyes for today. Uh, Sarah, do we have any shows coming after this show today? So here is a link to our um, to our schedule for the week. Uh, so it looks like TJ is coming up next. Uh, as far as Blazor, though, today is Tuesday. We just did our webinar here. Uh, we have Daniel Roth tomorrow. He's going to talk about PWA applications. So um, when I talked to Daniel about doing the show, he was really excited because apparently Build wasn't as long uh, of sessions as we're used to. So Build was cut down to 30-minute sessions. Normally conferences, especially one like Build, is an hour session. So um, Daniel didn't get to show everything he wanted to show at Build. So he's coming on tomorrow to talk about the things that didn't make it to Build. So that'll be exciting. Um, Marin can help you with the link on the docs for the two data source request async. Um, I'm pretty sure he's got that ready to fire off there. Uh, so tomorrow, beyond uh, Blazor, beyond the browser, uh, we're going to talk about progressive web apps and some other surprises. So I, even I don't know what Mr. Daniel Roth has in store for us. Thursday, Chris Santi, Microsoft MVP, uh, he has the um, 
Blazor local storage package that I talked about. We'll ask him some questions about that. Uh, but he's going to guide us through some authentication uh, with Blazor as well. Um, so we, we can revisit the Blazor authentication stuff tomorrow in more detail. On Friday, over on Jeff Fritz's C Sharp Fritz channel, we're going to talk about some of the cool NuGet packages that are available for Blazor. So come join us Friday at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time uh, for Jeff's show, and we're going to take two hours and dig in to NuGet packages that pertain to Blazor. Lots of lots of good ones out there for responsive and adaptive web, uh, local storage, uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, you can watch this in our other content later on our YouTube channel at uh, youtube.com slash Telerik. So coming up next at one o'clock is TJ Vantel. Uh, so TJ is one of our JavaScript experts here at Progress. And uh, he has a show coming up next. So if you stick around um, and you want to see some more content today, um, he'll be up. I don't know exactly what he's talking about. Sarah, if you, um, if you have an agenda for him, let me know. We'll share that with the audience too. Uh, oh, TJ's tomorrow. Okay, so uh, do we have anybody scheduled for today besides myself? Um, if we do, <laughs> the calendar is offline. So uh, we've got, all right, so we are done for today. Uh, did we give away all of our prizes to uh, winners today? We did, all right. So let's take a look here. So I don't know how many folks are in the room that are new. Uh, let's see, oh, I was gonna say we could raid someone, but there's actually no one. Of, it's a, I think it is a quiet day on Twitch. So I think we're just gonna go ahead and say thank you all very much. Um, there's a few that are still looking for information about prizes. Um, and uh, you can follow up here in chat. I'm going to go ahead and sign out. And um, we will see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, thanks for the folks that jumped over from uh the other platform and joined us on twitch um twitch is uh, a nice platform for us so uh, we're happy that we could change over and have you all join us so thanks for uh, working with us on the technical difficulties today uh, hope you all enjoyed it and uh, make sure you hit follow for the code at live channel uh, you can get alerts when we're online with more content and um, thank you all very much